April 9th. Yeah, April 9th. Um, I'm doing an event with SCI Four Corners to raise funds for no, CRWM. March 9th. March 9th, that's March right. 9th. What month is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, March 9th. Catch a we'll wait for Cody to close those windows. Oh, we're good? Mile High Hunt Expo. Beautiful. Mile High Hunt Expo. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's in April something. First weekend. April 5th, 6th, and 7th. Yeah. Yeah. She goes on the road all the time. <clears throat> Apparently. Well, lately. Now. Yeah. I mean, first quarter. This is kind of a new thing for us. I mean, this is our first time having an actual booth. We usually just go to shows and do some guerrilla marketing and just talk to people and get people engaged. But now we're, you know, stepped it up a little bit. Gotcha. Yeah. Give us a give us a full rundown before we get going. Just who you are, yeah. how you got involved, what what do you do? Just let the audience know who we're talking to today. Yeah, uh, I'm Charles Whitwam. I'm the uh, president and founder of Howl. We okay. started two years and a month ago, and uh, came off the victory of uh, protecting bear hunting in California. Okay, at the grassroots level. So before it was Howl. Um. So since we did that, I just basically felt the calling to bring people together and organize this and, you know, uh, do what we did there in California to get people engaged, give them an easy way to get engaged, um, inform them on the issues, you know, on what's going on and, and kind of build an army of activists, really. Are you from yeah. California? I'm Where? from Michigan. Michigan. I okay. live in, I live in California. Okay. I like to specify that. So. Yeah. That's a good way to clarify. People get a little, yeah. people get a little weirded out when they hear California sometimes. That so. wasn't a loaded question. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I, 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 should, I, pre I should preface that. So that wasn't loaded. <laughs> I, I, we, we like California. I, I went to California for the, go. for the battle. I, I do. I like people from California. Yesterday we ran into, I ran into two guys on the show floor, both of them, uh, Metro PD LA, both of them hunters out here. And yeah. just, we talked to them for an hour, you know? So yeah. I think there's a lot of good, I and mean, we have a lot of members from California. Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot of good bad. folks from California. So. Well, pe all right. So, you know, people <laughs> think of California, they think of San Francisco and yeah. LA, and it's just the most anti hunting place. It's it's actually, it's a huge state. And yep. hunting there is, is I think, is fantastic. I love hunting there. I love hunting blacktail. It's probably one of the best states to hunt black bear. Mm -hmm. People don't realize that, right? Um, wild pig hunting is amazing there. And the, the topography of, you know, you're hunting wild pigs in the coastal mountains. Mm -hmm. You don't. You don't get that anywhere no. else. It's completely different. It's my favorite thing to, to bow hunt is a, is a wild pig. So you, is that kind of the, is that how you started Hal? Was like with the, with bear hunting being kind of on the yeah. uh, hot button? Uh, you decided it you it do was, yeah. So before Hal, there was a, there was a, a wild pig bill uh, in 2019 that I was involved in. And, but it was, it was hidden in the bill was some language to actually restrict hunting mm -hmm. essentially it was a it was a it was a strange kind of trojan horse bill and uh we beat we beat that one and then uh the the bear bill was a senate bill to end bear hunting in california and that's where i think we re certainly really took off in in five days we had i don't know 30 some thousand emails calls whatever to the to everybody, to the to the entire Senate mm -hmm. in California, and it went all the way up to, um, I think even you guys even even yeah. were aware of that. And I know you know mediators. So it just blew up, and the bill was dead. They were like, "All right, we're not doing this." Within five days, hmm. it was a total grassroots effort of people just coming together, not in just California but across the United States, unifying, mm -hmm. you know, the the for the for the cause, and it was that. I got a call from uh, J.R. Young, actually. He goes, hey, the bill's dead. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And then I just started going, all right, what did we do here, you know, to to organize this? And and how do we start an entity uh, to continue that organization mm -hmm. and get people, you know, on board for issues across the United States where people are helping their brothers and sisters across state lines, you know, when, mm -hmm. because I mean, a lot of us are out of state hunters, right? Yeah. So it's not just, you know, this isn't like a, a, a school tax bill or something. And we're asking people in Iowa to get involved in California. We, we all hunt out of state, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, the Calif or 
Colorado is a perfect example. 58% of uh, CPW's funding comes from non-resident. Non hunters? Is it just the elk hunters? Non-resident elk hunters. Is yeah. what it is. Mm. So there's a reason right there. And then on the, on the decision maker side, if it is a senator or a congressman or whoever, we as hunters, as uh, non-resident hunters, we have a significant economic impact on those states. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect example in, in, in Colorado. So we, I mean, it's, we're basically, it's tourism. Yeah. Right? So they should hear from us. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of that is when you realize what the non-hunting industry is doing, not the, the, the anti-hunting industry is doing, they are obviously working across state lines. They're, they have a snowball effect. That's their goal. Let's work on California. We did a pretty good job in California. Now mm -hmm. let's go to Oregon. Let's go to Washington. Let's go to Colorado. So when you understand it, what they are doing, then I think sportsmen, outdoorsmen, hunters, whatever you want to call them, um, they're starting to realize we need to get in the fight now before it comes to our doorstep in our state, Yeah. before it comes to a a state where maybe you'd never expect it. Well, they're going to work on that because they're a, essentially a fundraising yeah. juggernaut. And that's how they, they work on the emotions of people. They don't work with, with facts. They work with emotions. And uh, a part of our job, I think, to combat that is to e well, educate. Let, let me, the, let, yeah. But they, they, they work on emotions, but they work on lies. Yeah. You, you mentioned facts. They, yeah, just, yeah. they just downright lie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a misguiding smoke and mirrors campaign at every single level. And I think the sportsmen and women have figured that out. But the general public believes what they see, especially on social media. So yeah, not, yeah, not to interrupt, but I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it is on the motion, but it's, but it's based on lies. Yeah, valid, valid point. Yep. What do you think? I'm curious as to, so California bill, bear hunting, right? And it was essentially killed through feedback of hunters. Do we, do we have a gauge on how many how much of that was uh, you know Californian people from California that were in support of hunting versus people that were out of state? On the on the Senate bill, I do not because we were not. I think that was mostly California. Mostly, it was certainly a lot of Californians was, for sure. That was California mostly, but second time around, it the, was it was a lot of out of state. The second time around, we were howl for wildlife. Yeah, and um, the Humane Society of the United States tried to end bear hunting through the commission mm -hmm. and we had i think 130 uh hunters show up to that commission meeting and give testimony the commission thankfully in california is they follow the department they follow the, they follow the department's recommendations and um and they embrace opportunity they yeah. they embrace the charter of creating opportunity with sustainable populations mm -hmm. which is for all it, which hasn't been the case. There was a time 10, 15 years ago where the commission was not as favorable. We have a great commission right now in California, which is perplexing. Like, it's so <laughs> weird to say it, but they're truly pro opportunity. We'll swap you. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, um, I was gonna really, ask it's later. Really <laughs> but I'll give you two were, for one. <laughs> they were so welcoming of hunters showing up on the Zoom calls in the, in the Wildlife Resource Committee sessions which is a very kind of ad hoc casual session in the commission meetings they they were they they, they talked to us in on breaks and be like thank you so much for being here we need you here and your value set communicated to this forum because we we know what you want but we need mm -hmm. to hear from you we showed up and challenged uh their lies they were focused on guess what trophy hunting mm -hmm. right yeah. and the commission challenged uh, the Humane Society at the time who was there and said, well, what number, what, what's the bear population? What they, what they say there was 14,000, they were claiming there was 14,000. It could be like 14 to 15,000 bears. Whereas so the Humane Society was claiming there was only that many bear in, in California. Yeah. And because the, the, the department came back with a presentation and said, well, no, that's not true at all. There's a minimum of 35,000 and we're actually, and none of us knew this, we're working on a, a, a new um, uh, project where it's looking like we're going to have 70,000 bear yeah. in California. And so the commission asked uh, Wendy Keepover, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And who's, who's, who's now in Colorado, of course, so yeah. across state lines. So what number are you going to be happy with where you're okay with bear hunting? 
there is no number was our answer. Mm -hmm. So right there, it's just, they just want to end hunting. It doesn't, it doesn't matter with our commission scolded scolded her straight up. He said, well, you came to us with a petition that challenged the, the viability and sustainability of the bear population in California. And clearly that's it's, it's fine. And you still don't want there to be bear hunting. So what you're saying is you want to change the law and you want to outlaw bear hunting. You need to take that. This is not the forum to do that. You know, this is where we set regulatory, you know, guidelines for sustainable take. And you're trying to outlaw something that that is clearly sustainable. So you need to go somewhere else. She did the exact same thing in 2007 in Colorado. Got up and testified in front of the commission. Keep over. Yeah. Oh, same one. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Same person, (laughs) same same format. But we were talking about fur bearers Mm -hmm. and and the, the number was zero. I mean, there was no suitable number. And the commission scolded her at that time. And that was, you know... 16, 17 years ago. So they're anti-hunters. They're not animal rights activists. They're anti-hunters. And they use this protect the critter, yeah. show up, you know, a cute picture that we all love and and get somebody that's that's uninformed and, and frankly probably just doesn't care one way or the other, you know, in a moment where they like they see that, they see a slogan that's a lie. And of course they're gonna make a quick decision. Mm-hmm. So we need to we need to inject friction into that by having our value set in that person's mind before they get that yeah. that slogan in that picture. You know, when the slogan comes out that mountain lion is inedible, not just that the people don't eat it, but it is inedible. Like that's a statement of fact that is a, it is an absolute lie. But when that slogan comes in, in Colorado this summer, you know, with the, with the ballot initiative, the person that's receiving that slogan needs to know you're lying to me <laughs> and you're lying to me clearly means i don't trust the rest of your campaign like we need to get in the, into those people's mindsets if you're lying to me about what is edible and edible right what else are you lying what, what are you lying about yeah you know and why i mean and I, why are you lying to me about i don't that? expect i don't expect vegans to want to eat mountain lion you know and i don't expect vegetarians to want to eat mountain lion but don't lie to me yeah and i think that the general public is starting to see through those lies if they can, if they can differentiate the difference between lies and facts, yeah, you know, and it's a, a, every each side has a story. It's just that do you tell the truth or do you lie? Yeah, I'm curious. So you started two and a half years ago. How is that what you said? Two relatively two years in a month. Two, two years in a month. Yeah, and then Colorado's for for the responsible wildlife management. How long is that? We started in 2017. Okay, so both relatively new. Um, in the grand scheme of things, and I've, we've talked internally, it, it seems to me like this has been <clears throat> the last year, I feel like is maybe two years has been like one of the hottest time frames for this type of stuff going on. Like you, you're starting to see, uh, states, we're going to skip the entire process. We're going to, you know, skip wildlife management. We're going overseas, C, you know, CPW, we're going to, we're going to do ballot initiatives. And we've kind of find this avenue that we're going to enact law that meets our objectives, these animal rights activists. Right. And I feel like, um, this has been a, like, I guess is what I'm building to is how, how, what is it about hunters? How do we get more organized? Like, how do we be better? Cause it feels like those groups, they have like clear avenues, clear objectives. They're all aligned, you know, and they're going for it. And it feels like we're a little bit late to the party. And it feels like hunting people that hunt generally, we're just like more conservative. We're like a lot less likely to stand up and shout from the rooftops like these individuals are. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how, what is it about hunters and how do we get more people involved? Well, I think it's information, uh, getting them the information first of all and giving them an easy way to get involved it that seems really simple but those avenues haven't really existed within our space Mm -hmm. and that's the number one question we get yeah how how do we get involved well because we are an industry that represents so many different angles and types of hunting and Mm -hmm. and even anglers and everything and there's a lot of ego involved and you know we're kind of and it's 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 natural to anything in in humanity but we're pretty competitive Mm -hmm. right and we're out there like i'm the best hunter no i'm the best hunter (laughs) the anti-hunters aren't out there saying no i'm i'm the best (laughs) anti-hunter you know what i mean right well well, we only go after predator hunting and we only go after you know after the hounds and we like they they work across all the lanes they're not like i'm gonna be more blunt i'm gonna be more blunt 
there's a lot of conservation orgs that do phenomenal work that needs to be done. Yeah. And they execute in their lanes. What CRWM does, what Hal is doing is new. And how, you know, we, we kind of refuse. We'll, we'll talk, I said to somebody the other day, we'll talk to the long range rifle folks today and we'll talk to the trad bow people tomorrow. Yeah. You know, they can bicker all they want, but we want them both in and we want to stitch that community together. Mm -hmm. And how do we do it? We need to step into the arena of public opinion mm -hmm. that's outside of hunting. And we need to message our value set to the urban 34 year old that works in Seattle. They need to know that there's a hunter that works on their floor and that they respect and they, 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 they hang out and have beers with after work. They need to know that there's a hunter in their community and that they're not and that they, when they, they vote against these things, they're taking away about, they're taking away, you know, rights, privileges, opportunities that are intrinsically human away from that person that they otherwise respect. So we have to get into that community. And bottom line is how does, how have the anti-hunting industry done it? They, they spend a lot of money um, over a long time. They have a they have a twenty year game plan, and so there's never a loss. They never lose. Mm -hmm. They just they just learn and they keep going. Um, it's it's their view. It's how they do social change. Well, and at the, at the risk of sounding divisive, to some level, uh, most of the acronym groups that we talk about, and I say this over and over and over, they're five hundred one c threes. There's only a certain amount that they can do within the limitations and the scope of the tax base. CRWM is a 501c4. We started that knowing full well when that, thinking that the gubernatorial administration that would come in after we formulated this, and I've been playing on this level hard since 2007 at a variety of different levels. But when we, do we want to do a C3, a six, a seven, a four? You know, do we want to create a pack? What do we want to do? And, and so we're not a membership organization. Uh, I work with all of the other organizations. I mean, they're partners in our efforts, but as a C4, we're the only organization in the state of Colorado that's got lobbying representation at the state capitol for sportsmen and women. We did that intentionally. And when we formulated the first year, we hired our first lobbyist. Now we've got three full-time lobbyists that help us. We do the yeoman's work at that level, but I joke, we're not out pulling fences. We're not doing calf and cow recruitment surveys, and we're not doing it. We don't have membership uh, magazines and and knives and all the other goo, you know goodies that we get. I've got a bunch of that stuff, and I'm members of all those organizations. But I think that that's the difference of empowering the sportsman and woman to get them to understand that there's somebody out there to do what they thought that the other groups were doing. And it's not that they don't do it at all, but they can only do a certain amount of their total revenue or their total expenditures toward the fight. And I think that the sportsmen and women are starting to see that. And you're starting to see the other organizations go, what do we need to do to mechanize and weaponize ourselves in a better landscape for what the sportsmen and women are, are looking at? The same with the industry. The industry has reached out and said, our customers want this. Now, they want that too, but they want to figure out a way to incorporate it both. Yeah, I want to, I want to t step back here a little bit and so we can set the stage. So, Charles, you started how? Yeah. Right? yeah. So you, that's, that's your like your grassroots initiative and essentially like the on the fly education of how to do this differently. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then Dan Gates, we have here from CRWM. Mm -hmm. Colorado's for responsible wildlife yes. management. Yep. And Mike, you're involved with that as well. Correct. How well, you're involved with how yeah. and by proxy support by proxy CRWM. He just likes yeah. me. That's yeah. <laughs> so well, the reason friends. why I want to step back there just a little bit and set the stage is I personally believe that this is a massive initiative for all hunters across the nation and what's going on in Colorado. And you, you saw it happening in California. It is insane to hear you say that California has a good board or a solid, it's wild for me to even think yeah. that the sad part is, is Colorado does not. And you no. would think that that would obviously be flipped. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, why we have you guys on here today is, is to help explain and, and really, you know, tell the back end of what is going on in a state like Colorado, because it's just one of those states that, you know, from afar, you wouldn't necessarily think is under such duress from the antis because I mean, everyone thinks of Colorado as the hunter's paradise, Yep. right? Like, I mean, we all grew up, it's, it's a, it's a destination on every hunter's map, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to go to Colorado, whether it be for elk, deer, antelope, bear, mountain lion, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like everyone thinks about it, right? And they have such support 
from hunters across the nation and they have such good foundation of ranching and hunting families in that state you just wouldn't necessarily think right um and it, and it's and it's a huge concern of ours we're watching it from afar we're getting involved with you guys we're actually going to get involved in a very deep level with you guys starting starting today um but i would i would love for you guys to really set the stage of exactly what is going on in colorado from what you guys have seen happen in california and how they're using that in colorado and what we need to do to hopefully have the victory that you guys had in in california mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well let me so let's bridge the connection between Hall and, and CRWM. Uh, we met two years ago, I think, right, Dan? But when when this ballot initiative dropped in September, September. is when you heard about it. On my birthday. Oh, yeah, yeah, happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Picking the tea. Yeah. And I, I was named in a lawsuit that day, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was clear to me <laughs> that it's clear to everybody this was going to be the next, this is going to be the biggest issue of the next year. Right. So I just want how we're, we're like, we need to promote what's going on there. So every, make it a nationwide issue. Mm -hmm. So every, so it's not just a Colorado issue and, and they're stuck with, you know, just working with Colorado residents to raise funds, to bring attention to what's going on. This needs to be a nationwide issue. Everybody, especially being Colorado, how many out of state hunters are there? Right. So, this is this is everybody's mm -hmm. battle, really. Yep. And that's um, what we can do is our organization. We can't tell people to vote this way or the other because we are a five hundred one c three. But our mission is to educate sportsmen on the issues. Well, that falls right in line. So we go to Dan and say, "All right, what's the messaging here? What is the issues? What is exactly is going on? And how do we distribute that to the nation? Mm -hmm. Right? And how do we get?" go hunt involved and meteor involved and Cameron Haynes involved and, and, and every single Joe, Joe Hunter, you know, out there. So they're aware of what's happening. So if they're in Colorado, are you registered to vote? Right. That was, that's a big, that's a big deal. There's a, over 130,000 or something like that, that weren't registered to vote for 2020 Republicans. with the, with the wolf introduction. Yeah, that's, not, that's not counting Democrats. That's just the Republican side. And, and the majority of voters in Colorado are independents. I mean, so so if you if you extrapolate that and you go, well, how many people didn't vote? Probably around two and a half million people. The entire state didn't didn't vote. Yeah. Now they weren't all registered, but they didn't vote. And and so whether you know if we lose at the ballot because everybody everybody that could vote voted, okay, then we lost. But to turn around and watch people sit on the sidelines and then criticize what did or didn't happen, and they didn't cast their ballot or, or they didn't contribute to the cause, whether it's in Colorado, California, you know, wherever then what are we really doing to support conservation in the North American model and, and, and our traditions and heritages? So that's kind of our partnership mm -hmm. is just, is simply that this is what's going on in Colorado. United States know about it, <laughs> right? We're, they, we're they, acting they, as a megaphone as much as we can. Yeah. Dan can talk about it all he wants, but you know, be, human behavior, hearing it from Dan is like, okay, yeah. Okay. And then, you, Oh, then you hear it from somebody else and then they hear it from somebody else. And then pretty soon, you know, there's a, there's a spectrum of when people will jump in and say, okay, this is validated for me. I'm going to jump in. And so we're, we're still scraping the surface. I mean, even the show yesterday, people are still, not everybody knows about this. No, yeah. Most people don't and, and, know about this. We've had huge success no. already with funding and with grassroots, but most people don't know about this and most people haven't jumped in. And so we're all working. You guys are now doing it. We're all working together. To, to create the megaphone and get that next layer of of advocates to jump in and say yeah I'll put 50 bucks on this I'm gonna I'm gonna support it because we'll see we'll keep peeling those layers back until the person that's today like oh it's not gonna win that person's gonna change their mind in August and they'll jump in and support yeah. so it's you know there's a lot of layers of people that we need to reach and everybody's going to jump in at their own pace. And so the more we can't wait till the third quarter to start, start our game. Like our game has to start today yeah. and it is starting today and other people might jump in in the third quarter and that's fine. We'll welcome them, but we need everybody as soon as possible. Yeah. And then yeah. CRWM has support from all 50 States now. Yeah. Financial support. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, really when, cool. you, when you look that's at, huge. when you look at and the examples I use over and over, there was 84 million visitors that came into the state of Colorado 
in 2022. I don't know what it was in 23. And some of that probably had to do with the overflow of COVID because everybody was cooped up for a year and a half or two years. But 84 million visitors. Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana combined had 33 million combined. Everybody in this country knows somebody in Colorado. Mm -hmm. They hunted in Colorado. They went to hunt in Colorado. They go skiing in Colorado. They visit somebody in Colorado. They went on a vacation or a destination wedding in Colorado. They drove through Colorado. Whatever. Everybody knows about Colorado. And if, if Colorado falls at this level, when we've you know, brought this much attention to the landscape, how far is it to where they actually see it happen in their state or maybe a place that they do hunt, yeah. whether, they, whether they participate or not? Yeah. And I think that that's the eye-opening deal to see where we're at because from a resident standpoint, the residents are starting to say, boy, I'm seeing a lot of stuff on the podcast. I'm seeing a lot of stuff in the newspapers. I'm seeing a lot of stuff in the magazines. Yep. I'm seeing a lot of stuff on forums and stuff around the country. And it's, and it's non-residents talking about what's happening in the Colorado, which then invigorates and enthuses and gives optimism to the resident. Because the resident for so long has sat there and gone, well, you know, what happens in our state boundaries of the Centennial State, this is what we've got. Well, now they're starting to see their buddies in New Hampshire and Michigan and mm -hmm. Florida and South Dakota that are contributing to the cause and then talking about the cause that we don't want it to happen here. What do we got to do to help them there? That's what the antis do. That's what the extremists do. They collect all of their funds and they go target something. We've scatterbrained yep. shotgun effect. Most of our efforts historically, because we're organizationally minded and we want to go to banquets and fundraisers and create all this stuff, which is fantastic because without that, we wouldn't have what we had today, but we have to be able to prop it up and support what we what we try to support, but we got to do it to the general public because the general public is what is voting on our efforts nationwide. It's not a Colorado yeah. deal when it gets down to that. Yeah, you guys, you guys are speaking on the that psychology science of the validation ladder mm -hmm. that it has to reach a certain point to where it's actually validated within the general population, and the antis do a phenomenal job with that because they they know what they're doing, and you know, sadly, a lot of um, kind of bigger, more recognized people in the world. I don't want to, you know, say celebrities by any means, because I hate that word, but they use them as spokespeople and it becomes, they, they are very good with that psychology of the validation chain. Right. And hunters traditionally, we haven't necessarily been just because like you yep. said, Dan, we're very organization focused and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff. Um, but Mike, like you said, you're, you're walking around the, the show mm -hmm. and you're saying not a lot of people know about this. Right, like yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people know about this. What exactly is this? What is going on? When I say this, it's the the potential for a ballot initiative in Colorado that would outlaw mountain lion hunting, mountain lion and bobcat hunting, mountain lion and bobcat. And where I say that, I say people coming up to our booth at the Howl booth, they maybe haven't heard of us, and they don't specifically know what's going on in Colorado. They've heard rumblings. But it's what we're giving them about information on this issue is net new to them. And they stick around and listen to it. And a lot of them are asking, well, what do I do? What, how do I help? You know, what, what are my options to help out? And so I think, I think there's a lot of people, you know, it's not like everybody knows. We don't have, the, the whole team isn't built. Mm -hmm. like, we're still putting it together. We've got people in Colorado that in, in the, around the country that have reached out saying, oh, I thought you beat that. Well, we, we did. We, do, we, we beat it several times through the Parks and Wildlife Commission. Right? Yeah, through the Parks and Wildlife Commission with this governor's appointments. We beat them 11 to 0, 11 to 0. Then they withdrew the petition in 2021. Then they came back to the legislature, and that's where we hooked up. Right. And we beat them at their own game at the Colorado State Legislature on Mountain Lions and Bobcats. So the only other option they had was to turn around and either move out of state or, or move in state and turn around and try to do something to, to do a ballot initiative. So we kicked the crap out of them over the course of the last four years. This is their last option that they can do unless they want to circle back around and try some other venue, some other avenue. Mm. But when you when you're as successful as what we were and the majority of people still don't know what's going on now, it's because we become so disconnected. They haven't paid attention. You got a victory over here. It's like ask anybody who won the Super Bowl two years ago. Yeah. We know who won the Super Bowl last year yeah. because the same ones won it this year. But who won two years ago? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I watched the game. I don't really, I'm, you know, you, who was in the Super Bowl? What happened in four years ago, it's it's a notch on our gun belt, but to the average general person, sportsman or woman combined, they don't understand that this is not a one-off. It's every single year. Yeah. It's every year at the commission, every year at the legislature, every year at the ballot, somewhere. And I think we've gotten benign 
in our own minds, and maybe hardened and complacent with mediocrity, that we haven't paid attention to what is going on on victories and or losses. You, you ask, well, what is this? And there's two other things that this is. Howell's wheel, our wheelhouse at Howell is getting hunters the ability to engage an issue at the right time with the right audience. You know, they say, contact your electives. Well, what if it's in the commission? You know, contact your electives. What if it's in a Senate committee? The only people that should hear from you is are the commissioners, if it's at the commission, or the, the Senate committee itself that's holding that issue. Hal's skill set is giving people an action center where they can go in and get that message directly to those those decision makers at the right time without our footprint or our, our, our thumbprint on it. Um, this going to a ballot box initiative you can't go to the action center and and turn and change somebody's mind on ha at how because this is going to go to a public vote mm -hmm. and so what we need and this is where crwm is is so important is we need to talk to the non-hunters the voting public in colorado which is why we need the money. all the non-resident hunters all of us this we need to fund the fight that buys the social media ads, that buys the billboards, that puts the right messaging in front of your average non-hunter in Denver and mm -hmm. Fort Collins and Boulder, and with language that resonates with them. Not, re not It may not resonate with us in this room, but it's gonna be language that resonates with them, and that's expensive. The nice thing is, is the conversation we have to have with those non-hunters who vote it's the same messaging that's going to help us us proactively steer wolf management. It's the same conversation that's helped us proactively steer Endangered Species Act reform. So this isn't like, you know, we're going to have a, a toolkit built here to win this on November 5th. On November 6th, everything that we've built out as a toolkit has use still. <laughs> yeah. I Myself included, I've been nonchalant. Like I, I didn't. I've always hunted. I grew up hunting. My dad hunted. We. All, I, I didn't ever see. I think I said on another podcast that we did. I didn't ever foresee this being something that was going to be we, potentially. We forgive you. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, mean, we all have. Yeah. yeah I, I didn't have. think it would ever be taken off the table. And I, <laughs> I, I think going back to you know what I said earlier, I, I, I've always looked at conservation as you know we're raising money for habitat. You know, we're, we're it feels like all of a sudden the devil's at the doorstep is what it feels like in the last few years to me. I, I, I never, I never thought that would happen, and all of a sudden it is. And I think it's, it's like you said, you know, these things have come and gone. You've beat it. You've been fighting it. But generally, as a, as a public, as a hunting public, we haven't really been aware of like these undercurrents going on. Well, and, and we started hard in 1992. We lost bear hunting in, in right. spring in 92. Mm -hmm. No hounds, no bait. And then four years after that, the anti-extremist, the anti-hunting extremist uh, capitalized and, and took away trapping in the state of Colorado. Amendment 14, mm -hmm. they, they, they changed the constitution of Colorado. And it took away foothold traps, body gripping devices, and cable restraint devices. At that time, in 19, 1998, there was a, a council that was formulated, the Colorado Wildlife Council, which, ironically, I sit on as the chair. Now, my term is up next year. Uh, but that was, that was the start of sportsmen coming together, going through the Colorado legislature to say, we need this. <laughs> Well, as the population of Colorado grew, you were at 2.9 million people then, now you're at 5.9. The funding mechanism that was created for that, which was based upon license sales, didn't keep up with the need uh, structurally and financially and, and institutionally to support the message that you had to get from a 2.9 million people to 5.9 million people that moved in. They weren't born there. Mm -hmm. They moved in with different ideologies about, you know, from they came from California or maybe the East Coast or maybe Washington, Oregon, trying to get away from the crap there. And then they wanted to impose things in Colorado that they hated back there because th they were familiar with it. Mm -hmm. There's only three states in the country that have councils like that. Why? That means that the sportsmen can go to their legislature and say, we want this. And if those sort of things are created, and then you commingle those thoughts on a broad scale. I mean, we do a great job when it comes to the conservation side of it. Yeah, We're going all the way back, you know, 125 years and and to everything that we that we strive to to promote. Look at 1937, the Pittman Robertson Act, the 53, the Daniel Johnson Act, and the things that have gone on since then. But who 
in our groups, organizationally, talks to the general public, talks to the non-voter, the non-hunter that yeah. votes. The ASPCA does on the other side. I mean, every Christmas it comes up with a bunch of ads <laughs> that we should all send $19 a month for the rest of our lives and, and get rid of our college education for our kids, but we ought to send it to some you know, puppy that probably died like nine years ago. <laughs> There, there's an idea, ideology there that we need to figure out a way to collectively put our mindsets mm -hmm. in the same wheelhouse and structure something that is going to benefit you and your kids. I mean, look, I'm the oldest bastard in this room. Good Every looking, though. You said, you know, it feels like all of a sudden the devil's at the door. Yeah. So the He's wolf, the, the wolf mm -hmm. lobby, the wolf proponents after wolves were released in Colorado, they, they got into some of the grade schools and had kids naming contests, name, name the wolves. Yeah. So that's freaking psychological warfare. Yeah. That, that, those kids, they should have had. 10 kids named wolves and 300,000 kids named ungulates and sheep and cattle. Because mm -hmm. that's reality is in those 300,000 kids that are going to have their named wolf die. Yeah. They can all be angry at Johnny's wolf yep. because that's, that's the reality, but they did the opposite. And now when Johnny's wolf that they've all named is killed by a rancher or killed under a depredation permit by CPW, who who are all those seven year olds and ten year olds gonna be angry with? They're gonna be angry with CPW. Yeah, the they're gonna be angry with ranchers. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be angry with they're gonna be angry with hunters. Mm -hmm. It's psychological warfare. Yeah, and it's and it's planned, and they're not trying to change a voter's mind. They're trying to change a voter today. They're trying to change a voter's mind twenty years from now. Yeah, with that action of of, in, of putting that. That that mechanism that that but then that, that kids that changes the kids and we need to mind. do that it changes the kids the yeah. kids parents mm -hmm. we need to do that we need to teach the kids and then steer this thing over the next ten to twenty yeah. years so there's a couple things going on there with the wolves in Colorado which yeah. leads into exactly the depths of what's going on today but explain what they did with that with the kids naming the wolves because well a lot of it people... creates a social and psychological bond with the wolf yeah they, well they had I mean. Just the one on one level is yeah. they had schools name the wolves yes. right. they were releasing. They the put league. in a contest. Yeah, exactly. were a contest. Kids, kids could turn around and pick. Exactly. And then, they, then that's they, what they, did. they psychologically aligned the kids yeah. with pro wolf. To be pro wolf. <laughs> Correct. Mm -hmm. So with with no re recognition for the 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 reality yeah. on the landscape of how that wolf makes its living. Correct. <laughs> So, so the, there's a couple a couple things there, like trail saying the devil's on the doorstep. And this those naming the wolf thing is is exactly that. But then also, right? Like I am not, I don't don't come from a biology background. The both these guys do. Trail mm -hmm. and Brady both come from a biology background. And I I look at myself as a as a valuable asset there, not being a biology background, where I can look at it from a thirty thousand foot level at face value and see what's going on. You have to have a biology background to be a C, to to be wildlife. It employed by wildlife agencies mm -hmm. in these states, right? But then you you look at it now, and they're going to public ballot box voting. Mm -hmm. Like I, to me, from a thirty thousand foot, I don't understand how that's possible. I don't understand how that's healthy. I just I don't get it. Where when science is so important to our stewardship of of animals and all the wildlife out there right mm -hmm. and that's that's what humans are right we're the stewards of of wildlife and the planet correct i don't understand how it can go to a uninformed ballot box voting popular vote that's when where the right to hunt, that's where the that's where the right, the constitutional amendments whether you want to call it the wild harvest initiative or the the right to hunt and fish initiative mm -hmm. that's where constitutional amendments need to be put in place that push wildlife management decisions to the department and commission structure. And, and I'm glad you said that because that's where that needs it's to not go. necessarily the constitutional amendment for the right to hunt and fish or the right to wild harvest. Those are components, but each state has the, the different nuances of what they can or can't do that even if you gave them the right to hunt and fish, that doesn't mean it's the unequivocal right yeah. to hunt and fish still whenever managed. you want, however you want, with whatever you want, you know, whenever you want. There's some components of that that people maybe have been misinformed about. Yeah. So some states that would work fine. Other states it doesn't work as well. Some states it wouldn't work at all. And so, but 
to change the makeup of how those decisions are made is possible through a constitutional right. The problem with that is, especially in states like us, probably Washington, Oregon, California, or wherever, mm -hmm. is to get the ideology of the general voter to say, you want to take this right away from me to vote on these type of things. Can you actually get that across the finish line? Because you now they feel like you're taking an opportunity away from them, especially in a state that is pretty much 50-50 on so many different things. If we had done it 25 years ago when we were more 60-40 and established that, and that's a good point for other states to recognize, get off your ass because I'm, what we're doing is we're begging, borrowing, and stealing, trying to get everybody to support us. You want to not be where we're at 20 years from now? Then turn around and get off your ass now mm -hmm. and set something up and set the structure up or you will be where we are at 20 years from now or maybe 10 years from now or maybe five years from now. Yeah. yeah. I think what you're saying... Uh, what everybody's saying here, and I think what you were getting at is there are experts involved in wildlife management. It's not always perfect. Nothing's perfect, but it's the best way. And to parallel it would be where the general public has a ballot initiative to vote on what the best procedures for brain surgery are. Or medical practice that doesn't happen air, right air mm -hmm. traffic control air mm. traffic control yeah let's just do that <laughs> you know like all of a sudden we're all experts that's crazy that's crazy to do it that way and that's what we have to get across with wildlife management it is this important and there are experts there with they have college degrees this yeah. is what they do this is their careers <laughs> let them handle that it's it's not always going to be perfect and it's certainly important for us to be involved to voice you know, our opinions and, and all that, but it, it needs to rest with, with the experts and it has rested with the experts and they lost. So now it all comes down to what fundraising and propaganda and how do we, you know, change mm -hmm. what the other side is doing? How do we change the public's perception on hunting or trophy hunting, whatever definitions they want to come up with yeah. to get their way. The thing about it is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost this idea that well, if we if we ban, you know, mountain lion hunting, that mountain lions are just going to live forever and they're not going to die anymore. Well, California is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, that was banned. And all that happened, there was zero mountain lions that were actually saved. The same amount of mountain lions are killed every single year, but now it's killed. They're killed by contractors mm -hmm. um, or the government. So with the only, money, the only thing that happened. Yeah, exactly. So. The very people who voted to save the mountain lions. All right, so now hunters are not paying into the system um, and involved in the management process that California, you know, our department, you know, had set in place. Now mountain lions are dying from your tax dollars, but that's not talked about. Zero yeah. mountain lions have been saved. Because a professional did it. There's been 7,700. Right. Some, some Talk, talk a little bit about the language of trophy hunting within this. That's what I to get at. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> talk about, yeah. Talk about, so yeah. Talk, talk about the term trophy and so, how it's being used. So, what they've utilized, I mean, they're trying to set a precedent state and nationwide for the definition, statutory definition of trophy hunting. Yeah. And while we were successful of taking trophy hunting out of the ballot language for the title, it still remains in the measure. Mm -hmm. So if anybody who's familiar with the blue book, you get the big blue book and you look at what's on the ballot and then you got to read the Wikipedia, you know, definition of all the ballot stuff. But the title is what they're going to see on the ballot. We took, we got the title to, to be able to have trophy hunting out of it, mm -hmm. which is a, we consider a major victory, not in the sense that it makes it any easier for us to succeed, but it's not necessarily a lie to the general public, to the voter, because it's a hunting ban. Mm -hmm. But their definition of trophy hunting in the measure itself is to intentionally kill, wound, stalk, or entrap, or pursue a mountain lion, bobcat, or a lynx. And I need to throw a lynx in there because it's often overlooked that mm -hmm. it's in there so that if they ever become delisted, they don't want any harvest whatsoever. Lynx are not harvestable in the lower 48 in, mm -hmm. in any capacity because of federal and state you know, regulation. Judge. The, the average voter doesn't understand. So when we asked our attorneys, asked their attorneys in the title board hearing, why is Lynx in there? Well, because if they ever become delisted, we don't want them to ever be harvested. Well, the fact of the matter is they don't want, to they don't want any, 78, any of the 78 game species in the state of Colorado to ever be harvested, period. Mm -hmm. So you could take any one of the species that we got 
and plug the, it in. Their definition of what it is, whether it's mallard ducks, mm -hmm. maybe it's bighorn sheep, which in, a, in an article last year, Tris Dornio in the Colorado Sun said, why are bighorn sheep any different than mountain lions? Mm -hmm. They're already setting the tone and narrative, just like naming wolves. Why are they different? It's our state animal. Why are we allowed to harvest those? Ask the Wild Sheep Foundation, the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Society, why we harvest bighorn sheep. Because of sheep conservation efforts, and because the only money that's gone into that is from the hunting side of things. Trophy hunting has become bastardized to the point to where it's almost like this, you know, taboo word. I mean, look, what's a trophy to you? Is it is it a is it a rabbit that your that your sure. beagle went out and got for the first time? It's subjective. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, I see trophy wives all over the place. Sure. I mean, we don't turn around <laughs> and ban those. You know, we, we there's 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 what's a trophy room? I went to a guy's trophy room before, and we can disagree have, on that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did. I didn't. I didn't do. He didn't have any game heads. He didn't have any mounts. But yeah. by God, he had about nineteen thousand other trophies that he got. So that's. It's the catapulting of our successes and our wishes, wants, and desires to a level of what we do for appreciation on the landscape. It just so happens that conservation goes into what are you doing for the most magnificent harvest? My wife has got a doe deer on the wall. My kid's first buck is a two-point buck. I mean, mm -hmm. those were trophies to them because the accomplishments, the testing and the, the preparation and the scouting and the, you know, the practicing, the shooting and the, you know, all the stuff that goes into that went into that. But the, but the, the idea to the general public, the non-hunting general public, they visualize trophy hunting as you go out, you shoot something, you cut the head off, and you turn around and walk away from it. That's what our enemies, and I say that wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. our enemies have lied about of what trophy hunting actually is. Trophy hunting that we can find is not in any state statute in the United States whatsoever. There's wanton waste laws, there's poaching laws, which don't have anything to do with hunting but it is not trophy hunting. Trophy hunting is in the eye of the beholder, and people need to understand that when we are doing what we are doing from a regulated, abundant resource, we are doing it for the preparation of food, we're doing it for the salvaging and utilization of the materials that go along with that animal, and we want to turn around and make, it, make sure it's sustainable in, per, in perpetuity. Yeah. This goes back to this psychological operation that they've been yeah. conducting for the last 20 years yeah. or, or longer. There's two things about trophy hunting. They've change the mindset of the non-hunter to think a dirt a, they, they think of like chopping the tusks off of an they elephant took the and leaving word, the body man, I, I hate that they've they taken took the that word. poaching yeah. parallel and mm -hmm. applied it to what we do every yeah. day in terms of attempting to hunt and find a the selectively choosing the largest male mm -hmm. that provides the least to the herd like that's it trophy hunting should be recognized as the most sustainable both ecologically and economically right. but they've corrupted it mm -hmm. and then by doing so they also have you know me the average hunter second guessing should i share this picture that's the point i and was that's gonna what make they want that's the other thing they want they it, don't done want well. us sharing our pictures that's a trophy they don't want us sharing our stories because <laughs> when we share our pictures when we share our stories and it goes to the non-hunting community that i affiliate with yeah. and i hang out with and they see what i'm doing and they gain respect for it and they like it we gain social validation or acceptance outside of our hunting community by sharing these stories they want us to shrink back and we have we, and we, we shouldn't. We, we've done. I mean, you, you we can need to not shrink done back to ourselves. That's what I'm saying. We need to you, not shrink back you, and you, hide. You can listen based to a, on that. You can listen to a lot of people that are very, uh, you know, well known. I'm not known. a trophy hunter. Like the first thing yeah, that's what I first I'm not thing. A or, or you need to be, be careful. Yeah, you need to be careful about what you post. It needs to be tasteful. It we need to, to be... retake that word and redefine it on our terms. Yeah, that's so that the non-hunter says, mm -hmm. "Wow, they pass up on immature bucks." Wow, they'll eat their tag. Mm -hmm. They'll pay into the system and eat their tag because they didn't come across a yeah. critter that was that met their standard. What human activity do we have where we don't try to do better the next year? Yeah, you every, know? every activity, everything, everything. 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 T well, from t-ball to are we going to get a to, participation you know? trophy just so we turn around and go out there and we and ninety percent of us aren't successful on our tags? Yeah, you know, the, do you, you know, this is what I got. This, you know, I paid into the system and I didn't do anything. But but to, we should to, shrink away. Exactly. And to your point, the misinformation about trophy hunting, we got into a debate two years ago with legislators on gun stuff in Colorado, in which they just dumped a bunch on us this week that you just read it and go, how do, what do they do? They sit in a room and, you know, they, they don't understand the facts. They do don't they understand. not have real jobs like the rest? No, of well, they do. They, they do. <laughs> but the real job is, is, is misconstrued to some degree. No. But you asked a legislator at that time, do you agree with military sporting rifles? 
Well, I don't think there's a problem with that. But you're trying to ban assault weapons. I mean, it's whether you like it, whether you like mm -hmm. that that tool or not, it's wording because it's the exact same thing. It's just that they don't know what it is. And how do you explain that to somebody that doesn't know what that is? If you talk to the general public and you say military sporting rifle, I don't have a problem with that. It's coyote tan. It's okay. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh huh. You know. I'm I'm glad you said that because that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Is we have we've at, at the fear of losing opportunity, we've sulked back in and we've pulled it back in. Like we're not going to do grip and grants. We're gonna. I mean, we're gonna pull back any kind of contact at, at the fear of offending somebody that could potentially take my right to do this thing that I love. I think we just need and to I, include the story. We yeah, need to include the context. The more yeah, we add, the more context. context when we add the yeah. context, that's add the add post to your Instagram, your trail cam pictures and your scouting and the and the work and the adventure and the failures that lead up to that success. Yeah. yeah. Build the context of the story. Then when they see that, like, damn, you've been you've been put in time. You know, you've been put in time, you've been put in miles. Like that's I realize it's hard work. I realize it's more complicated than than I knew when they see that gripping grin. And then the community that that sees that that doesn't hunt is more likely to give you high fives when you get to that success mm -hmm. than but if you only post the grip and grin yeah we're done the 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 community that you're trying to share that with which includes non-hunters typically they don't have the context yeah. and so then the context gets filled in by who the anti-hunting messaging correct they get to own they get to own the they own story, the story from there right yeah but you got you guys touched on it earlier specifically you mike about you know you guys will talk to a trad bow hunter today and a and a long range rifle hunter tomorrow yeah what you're speaking on is is the frayed and broken threads and on the underside of of right. hunting where i say we're doing it to ourselves about this kind of sulking back about trophy hunting and being proud of what we do and all this stuff yeah and fear of like trail said you know somebody taking taking our rights away right that's what i see go hunt for that's what that's what we stand for right our mission statement is to allow people to live in more adventurous life through hunting right. i don't give a shit what kind of hunting you do i don't care if it's trad i don't care if it's long range i don't care if it's sitting in a tree stand it doesn't matter yeah because if you're a hunter you're part of the system of conservation right you're you're part of the machine that is going to keep hunting around for perpetuity yeah and that's where we see ourselves is to spread the message of you know, drop the swords of the ego. No one is better than anyone here. We're all hunters, right? We're all paying into the system. We're all doing what we love and we all support each other, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't care if you killed something with a trad bow, that's unbelievable. If right. you killed something at 700 yards, unbelievable. You guys are both out there doing a craft that is extremely hard to do. And I'm sure it took you massive amounts of practice to, to be able to do it. Yeah. Right. And a lot of preparation, all that stuff. We as a company want to take the stance of helping you guys as the hunting company. That's that's our tagline, right? We are the hunting company because we don't give a shit what you do. Yeah. And so that's what we need to focus on on behalf of you guys to help spread the message through all these threaded, all, all these frayed threads on the undercurrents of, of hunting, which drives us insane. This whole ego of who's better and who's not. But as Charles said, right, like we're all very competitive. That's why we do what we do. And we all have egos. We, I mean, it's kind of a, any male dominated sport is going to be pretty thick with egos right <laughs> but in these in these cases man we, we just got to figure out a way for people to put down the swords of of ego and and their own heritages to accept the other person so we can all get on the same page and fight for and this so, uh, over this trophy hunting thing it's such a bullshit word i love trophy hunting i love mm -hmm. it i am absolutely willing to eat a tag and only take mature animals like and I am very proud of that fact. But and you're I taking the whole critter off the mountain too. The whole like it's all going home. home. It's all going home. Of course, I have no Absolutely. issues with that. But I also don't give a shit about the guy who's out there has only been hunting for two years who does kill a two point. I don't care because I feel like we offset, right? Like I've been lucky and fortunate enough to do this for a very long time, and I, I'm there's I'm just at a different place, right? Like, mm -hmm. and maybe that and guy is it, and I don't care. Unintentional. The, they do it. We we do it to ourselves unintentionally. Just because we have a particular like or dislike or an avocation of where we've been brought up, or or maybe that's the laws, rules, and regulations, or maybe it's what's what's accessible to us. We do that unintentionally to to not we we're dividing and conquer conquering our resources because we pay into a system of conservation support. And I mean, how many guys how many guys do you know that go to so many different banquets? Pheasant banquet, duck mm -hmm. banquet, elk banquet. 
We all come together at those mm-hmm. for the same cause. Uh, how many guys turn around and come together to, to go hunting into, into a, a different state for a different species, a different method of take? We all, we all do that. Our, I think our message that we need to try to get out is, at least from our perspective, is Colorado use the borders of Colorado, and it's kind of a square state anyway. I mean, it's just, you know, there's not much of jaggedy lines there anywhere. It's not like Louisiana or somewhere. Uh, <laughs> no offense to Louisiana's lines. I just want to make sure, you know, Colorado came from the Louisiana Purchase, so we yeah, need to make nice, sure that that's part, nice, of, the, nice that's part of the conversation. Louisiana. You've offended somebody. Yeah. <laughs> so that wouldn't be the first time. But, <laughs> great historical context. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but there's, there's something there that we can capitalize on to say, I'm where you're at, or you might want to be where I'm at, or maybe we just try to get to the same place together. And I think if sportsmen and women, conservation-minded hunters and anglers, the hook and bullet crowd, would figure out a way to put their differences aside in their own mind. And I'm not saying that hardline differences to where you can't go to the family reunion together because one guy bow hunts and the other guy crossbow hunts. You have to figure out a way to commingle our efforts collectively within the borders of the United States and include Canada because the North American model of wildlife conservation is part of that whole deal. We need to educate ourselves participate in the landscape that is in our own circle and then broaden our horizons to broaden that net and cast that net at a farther reach. That's what we're able to accomplish off of this because we are within the state. But as I mentioned, everybody that comes through and everybody that wants to participate and everybody has to, I mean, how many, how many hunting shows do you know that you've seen that have been filmed in Colorado? Every uh, single one. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, it really yeah. is every it's, single one. Yeah. Every, uh-huh. every, every, every hunting show that I know, every, every celebrity you know, a sportsman or whatever has been to Colorado to do something. Mm-hmm. Period. They might not live there. They might not own a ranch there. They might not outfit with the same outfitter there. But they've all been there. Why? Because it's the number one state for elk. It's become the number one state for deer. Things have not gotten as good as what they used to be. It's probably going to continually get worse because of population demographics and so forth, and just because of population growth. But Colorado is in the center of the country for the most part. Not direct center. I think Kansas or Missouri probably is, but we're close. But 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 we're in the center. Of, we, are, we become the epicenter of what people idealize for hunting. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't let that go unnoticed because if Colorado falls, then what becomes the center of ideology for hunting? Yeah. Do you uh, so within this this mountain lion proposal and and in terms with the, the word trophy hunting? Was part of that that uh, they would potentially allow you to continue to hunt mountain lion, but you wouldn't be able to take the the head and the hide? That was the, that was the second they, initiative that okay. they tried to get passed as we were challenging through the Supreme Court on the first one. Okay, and as they figured out that we were going to be able to to uh, go punch for punch for them monetarily through the legal process. Yeah, they decided to drop that. They withdrew that on January thirtieth, and they went back to the first one that they actually had affirmation for the Supreme Court on. Gotcha. Okay. And that's important. So what he just said, they figured out we were able to go punch for punch with them. Mm-hmm. That's because of the involvement. That's because of the funds that came in. So then CRWM as an organization was able to do that. Mm-hmm. And without everybody being involved, they wouldn't be able to do that. Right. So that's that's really important. That's a win. Yeah. They've already won rounds one, two, one, and three. One, two, and three. Out right. Of Fifteen round bout. Round, which, which, in round which four is now. huge. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if you did you touch on this. Um they are planting a flag in making a statement that's saying mountain lion is inedible. Uh, bear, I've heard defenders of wildlife say this to the New Mexico legislature that nobody eats bear. It's inedible. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, do you, is that what you really think? Or is this, are you just counting on us mm-hmm. not getting the truth out? Because that's a lie. It's a lie. It's, it's 100%. A, it's a historical lie. It's a factual lie. It is a lie in every every angle that you look well at. Black bears my favorite game to eat yeah. it, i and love to it. show that charles it, dur- during the title board process and this is the lies these are very well educated attorneys that are representing mm-hmm. our opposition and and they'll represent us if we can afford them or they'll represent you or you know they, <laughs> they go to the highest <laughs> Wherever the wind blows. They, yeah, exactly right but what what they said on on that specific issue when they said nobody is going to leave the hide and the head in the field so this is a trophy hunt. And we went, oh, contraire. Colorado law says that you have to take the hide and the head out of the field to have it 
physically inspected and tagged by Colorado Parks and Wildlife mm-hmm. on a bear or a lion. Yeah. They didn't even know the regulations, but they were trying to bullshit the title board into getting their language of what they wanted on the ballot. Nobody does this. They can't do that. They're not hunting for the meat. You have to take the meat. You have to take the hide. You have to take the head. All meat in Colorado for big game animals has to be prepared mm-hmm. for human consumption, and the hide in the head has to be taken out. The caveat to what you were talking about <clears throat> on initiative 101 that they threw out there as a smoke and mirrors deal using our argument yeah. that you had to bring the hide and head out, which is Colorado law anyway, right. but you had to surrender that hide and head and all the claws and mm-hmm. everything else to the agency, the managing agency. And then you could take the meat. That was their circumvention of the word trophy right. because they lost on the first go around. My point is that no matter what, no matter how you decide to alter your message, their message is no harvest, mm-hmm. no utilization, no consumption, no management, no nothing. Yeah. So, but where are they now? So they've they've selected, we'll call it ninety one. It's going to have a different number. They've they've selected the the language for this ballot. Yeah, initiative. we want to make sure that people understand that. It, and that now they're out. The number. Now now they have a window of time that ends roughly the beginning of July to get their signatures, and they're using volunteers. Mm-hmm. They could pay for signatures. They could pay a lot of money, maybe a couple million dollars. That's for, legal. For, yeah, so mm-hmm. there's signature gathering companies and, and a lot of, you know, if you have a really well-funded, uh, wow. you know, it depends on how much money a, an organization wants to throw at something. Yeah. But they're getting, they're out there in their signature gathering window of time. And so I can't do this because I am in California. I can, I can mm-hmm. invest money with CRWM so that they've got money to do the messaging when this is actually on the ballot, but you know, folks that are in Colorado, what can they do today besides financially supporting CRWM? They can let their community, their, their church, their coworkers, their adult softball league, their, the people they work out with Mm -hmm. the, this, the spin class they go to, whatever they can let their community know what this is about and that there's some really significant lies being told by the proponents of this initiative such you know mountain lion is edible mountain lions are sustainably harvested as a as an abundant successful critter on the landscape in colorado there's lots it's it's doing well within a regulated framework Mm -hmm. and that the biologists should be able to choose how that regulation is done and so if there can be friction injected to where they don't get their signatures just by grassroots community messaging from hunters and people that want wildlife managed professionally, um, maybe they don't get their signatures and then it's not on the ballot. And we win in round four, Mm -hmm. you know, we we win in round four or five instead of having to go all the way through to the, to, to the, uh, to a vote. vote. And that would be huge. Yeah. And and I've got my own particular opinions. He does. I know you do. You know, and, 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 and because, should be, be, this is this is not going to go away. Yeah, if, I don't, if we it if we seem like it is, I would just, like to win a, win in round four or five. Yeah, but they'll be back in twenty six. Sure. Mm-hmm. So then we start over. It'll be a different. What I want to do, I mean, I'll just put it out there. I want to I want to go. Let's let's go to the mat, and let's <laughs> let's kick the living shit out of them mm-hmm. in November, because if we do that, they won't come back for several years. They might go somewhere else, but then we've already built the roadmap and the playbook mm-hmm. for other successes and other victories in other locations. In, in reality is you're going to have to do both. Like right. you, oh, yeah. you're going to, you're going to do what you say you're going to, we're trying to, there's nothing lost. Yeah. No. Nothing we, lost. We, yeah. If we, we make no. it harder for yeah. them early, yeah. then early, the vote will be harder for them as well. Vote, then Everything it, then invested at that point. Yeah. You, you got to do both. Right. Yeah. It's, it's probably yeah. as long, as long as the enthusiasm on the landscape continues to build and the momentum continues to build in Colorado and then uh, in neighboring States and then farther out and you get that, you get that radius, that diameter of the of the success to move mm-hmm. outward, because th- they're going to go to New Mexico. They're going to be or, or I mean, Utah, look, Utah. Or I mean, Utah. The, the Wasatch yeah. Yeah. Front, right? You know, I mean, look, you, look at what they're doing. You, you look at our population based in Utah. I mean, it's all along the Wasatch Front. And if you look at politics, Utah just we're not up that I mean, far off. You can kill lions year round. Yeah. I mean, there's. I mean, come on, they're, yeah. they're not going to stop. Sure. There's. They thought that that Colorado was the low hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. They had some successes. 
more more importantly, they had agenda-driven politicians that were put into place that could put people in places to make decisions on other levels. And then the the demographics of the state changed so much that elected it, officials it became more yeah. elected officials. We'd be doing the same thing if we had mm -hmm. enough brains to be able to turn around and put the right people in. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... Democrat or Republican aside, I say the majority of the state is independent. Mm -hmm. The ma majority of most states are independent. So you, just because you have blue and red doesn't mean that it's one side or the other. It's not, it's, to me, it's 50 shades of gray. Mm -hmm. It's not black and white. And I think that because of the, the numerous amount of avocations that we have in the hunting and angling industry, I mean, you got fly fishermen, and you got catch and release fishermen, and you got bass fishermen, and you got trout fishermen, and you got you know bait fishermen, and you got all this stuff that's out there. Are they all against each other? I'm more important than you because I'm in a sponsorship deal, and this little tournament is better than that tournament. When you get into wildlife conservation, we segregate ourselves to the point to where we don't pay attention to the issues at hand, mm -hmm. and the enemy is constantly paying attention to the issue at hand. Why? Because they want it all gone. Yeah, every single little bit of it. Yep. And I think that we've got an opportunity to capitalize on this over the next six or seven months and to send them packing and to capitalize on our successes to where everybody else can capitalize. And we build up a fortress and we build up an armament or a moat that we can say, you're not crossing this, not any longer, no matter where it is, we're not going to, we're not going to stand for it. Yeah. I wanted to ask a question. I've heard you guys mention like, and people ask, what can I do? Um, I've, you, you've said funding or donations. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about money and the role it plays and what donations do and how much you need and where it goes? And because I, I think there's a hesitancy, <laughs> if, if I'm being completely honest, like within our industry, within, you know, people that hunt, right. we've got these conservation organizations, you know, we, we all kind of know who they are and people have donated money for a lot of years. And, you know, we've put elk on the landscape and mule deer and you kind of like donate but you don't really know where it goes or what happens to it or why you're donating exactly this to me feels like the opportunity for for your organizations to tell people this is what we need this is where it's going and this is the difference that it's going to make so you talk a little bit about funding i think th that's the main thing that the the non-resident can do to contribute besides talking to the people that they know in in the state of colorado that say, I heard this, maybe you should turn around and pay attention to this because it's in your state. Mm -hmm. Funding is something that the guy in Florida can do and the guy in California can do to help us build up our war chest to get to the point to where, like Mike was talking about, waiting to August when, if they get it on the ballot, which they're in a process now, if we wait till August to say, we need your hand, we need your helping hand, we need your wallet, we need your credit card, if we wait till then, it's too late. We have to build up that war chest now. And I need to preface that with, this is a, a presidential election year. Yeah. Whatever you do now can be bought for August, September, and October as a pre-buy. If you wait till August, what you want to buy then, but what you could now is going to cost you three to five times the amount of money, depending on what state it is. So you can buy television time or network advertising now for instance, um, $100. In August, the same time is going to cost you three to four hundred dollars. So we have to build up now to build up what we need to be able to do to build up that that armament, that playbook, the roadmap, and the strategy. And that's where the non-resident comes in. That's where the anti the the anti anti hunter comes in. The guy who who doesn't want to see hunting ballot box biology, mm -hmm. they can contribute in that manner to get us to the point to where we can say we're not scrimping and scrounging on. Well, could we afford to advertise in that district? Can we afford to advertise over here? I mean, look at look at the anybody that does anything for long term investment. We as sportsmen and women plan two, three, four years in advance to go hunting. <laughs> yeah, we can we can figure that out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally. Yeah. I mean, whether it's whether it's trying to get in shape. Yeah. Whether it's saving up the money. Whether it's planning your next deal. Whether it's getting your preference points. Whether it's booking your outfitter. I and mean, we're all here at the Western Hunt Expo. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same thing. We we plan three, four, five years in advance. Why do we have to wait to the last minute? We pay years in advance. We pay for hunts that we may never even go on by buying by points. licenses and tags just so we can accumulate points. Mm -hmm. You know, or I, just, I just I just bought my license and 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 point in Air Oregon because I want to go spring bear hunting there in, in the next couple of years. It's 180 bucks or something like that. Just like we do that. Mm -hmm. We do that. We invest for opportunity that might be over the horizon. This is today. My, my, my call is what's a box of ammo cost to you? 
what's 12 arrows cost to you? Take that dollar value, no matter where you are in the US, and fund this. Don't wind check it and see like how's it looking or how you know, do you do you do you load up your pack and and put your rifle on on the pack and carry it in the woods, or do you leave it in the truck until you see the elk? Like load up, like put the fuel in the tank now. Yeah, get this thing funded now. If it's overfunded, like what a what a miracle that would be. If there's money left over, a C four can transfer. <laughs> he could transfer something to to Washington. He could transfer something to other states. This fight is about what's going to happen with wolf management. It's about other issues that are going to come up on the horizon. There's no such thing as this thing being overfunded. And so nobody. I mean, there are people writing ten thousand, fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar checks. But if every hunter that dreams of mule deer and elk in Colorado at some point to, 50, to 50 show, bucks to 50 show bucks. to show how easy it is uh, 192,000 non-resident sportsmen and women that apply for licenses in the state of Colorado come the first week of April have to buy a qualifying license mm -hmm. to be able to participate in the draw process They'll never use that qualifying license unless they go to the state of Colorado. But you have to buy it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a $39 license or a $54 license, whether it's a combo license, whatever you decide to, to pursue on that, you have to buy that license. How about just you buy the license and double it and give us what you would apply for that license that you're never going to do anything with except for a piece of paper so we can help defend and defeat these messers. So when you apply next year, it's we're saving there. hunting in Colorado in perpetuity. If, uh, if 192,000 sportsmen and women that apply to get preference points or to buy that qualifying license would just contribute to this cause, we could beat this and we could build up an armament to where not only are we defending the issues that they're so interested in, they're, they're paying to be able to come here and hunt, that we could actually show Utah or New Mexico or whomever how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, why to do it, and the best flipping way to do it. Yeah, you know, man. So the, the the strategy with these funds, the money that's being raised, what I'm getting from you guys mm -hmm. is it's primarily just on-site, grassroots, marketing, campaigning, education. We hired a campaign strategy company, PacWest. Uh, Mark Turex is actually here at, Go, at the uh, Hunt Expo with us. And I uh, would like to introduce you guys if, if you already haven't met Love him. Love to meet him. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he's the guy. I mean, th that's what they, this is what they do. Um, we're taking guidance from not only them, but the polling and the strategy sessions that they've actually, you know, come up with the data that they've collected, they know the landscape better than anybody in, in, in Colorado. And that we didn't hire an outside state firm because while they might be really good, if you can't name the legislators and some of the commissioners that we have to deal with, how do you know what some of our voters are going to do? Mm -hmm. Now they can do the same type of thing, but they're not grassroots. They're not in state. They're not boots on the ground. And so when we hired PacWest, and I, and I, I want to say, when this came out on September 22nd, we had PAC West hired and our attorneys hired on the 25th. We had two weeks to be able to mobilize and activate in preparation for what was in the inevitable. Nobody else offered to do anything. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that negatively. Mm -hmm. It's because they have boards and they have structures. It was the middle of hunting season. You couldn't get people together on a 501c3 to make a decision if we're going to spend $250,000 three days later on something that was going to happen three states over. We had the ability to be able to pull the trigger on that at that time. That's why we're in the position that what we are is because we could pull the trigger with PacWest. We could pull the trigger with our attorneys and we could be in the fight from the start. And I don't think that the opposition thought that we were going to be able to do that financially and, and, and systematically, strategically. Otherwise, I think that they thought that they probably would have started gathering signatures November 1st mm -hmm. through the holiday season. And they'd have probably been done by March 1st, and they'd have been rocking and rolling. And we, we prolonged, we denied, we defeated every single effort that they did, except for just the, the whole deal of being able to cancel it and not get it on the ballot. They're in the process now of doing all the... We're in, we're in charge of the campaign. We're in charge of what they're doing. We can't stop the process and the legal procedures, but we, we altered it and detoured them to the point where people need to see how successful we were because of the strategy mm. that we had before we hired PacWest. Mm -hmm. 
And then when we hired Pac West, they could turn around and say, okay, this is the plan of action that we're going to do, and this is the monumental effort that we're going to undertake. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a good point to press on too. Is I, I can speak for myself and and the people that I'm around. I can't speak for everyone, obviously, but there there seems to be a general sentiment in the hunting community that we just take a lot of losses from the anti. Oh yeah, like we just we feel like we're getting constricted every single year, mm -hmm. and it's and it's gotten to the point where you know this 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 kind of retraction from putting our pictures out there and all that stuff where it's the man managing the bleeding or kind of managing the damages and losses and we're we're just trying to save what we have left but there's a really good point to be made when we talk with with you guys there has been plenty of wins that we have had yep. mm -hmm. plenty of wins they're, i think that's they're defensive really, wins i think they're defensive a, wins though we're where we're defending we haven't had a lot of proactive wins where we're we expanding but, there but are, we, but can. we can if we because get out we, of that mode because you know organizations like yourselves yeah. have proven that we can win we yeah. can win on these grassroots defensive levels that you, it gives you all the hope you need well, there's proactive there, enforcement. There's, we're going yeah, yeah so there are so it's a constant battle it's not like you know <laughs> we won or we lost and then that's it it's just always going mm -hmm. right and i think as hunters we we kind of do have a defeatist attitude um but it's an ongoing fight. It got, ends. It ends when we make the anti hunters irrelevant. I think we can do that, maybe in the next twenty years. It's a, it's a it's a long term goal for sure. But we really need to pierce the veil to get our messaging into the general public. But we do have a lot of wins. I mean, just since we started. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> gosh, there's everything from simple thing. Well, I guess it's simple, but Sunday hunting in uh, the state of is it Virginia? Which one was it now? Because we worked on a couple of them. There's one in South Carolina. There's like seven states that still have no hunting on Sunday. Um, the people we worked with, I believe it was Virginia, they had been trying to get this passed for 20 years. And they used Howl. They, we partnered with them two years ago now. And we just flooded the legislature with support for that. And they passed it. Um, the right to hunt and fish in Florida was going through the legislature last year. Went through the Senate unanimously. Went through the House. Saved one vote. I think one, one, uh, one House member voted against it. That's now on the ballot for 2024 for, for the residents of Florida to get that, you know, a right to hunt and fish there. Um, our very first action when we started in January. Um, John Stallone, who who is uh, a, a director, founding director with me, um, with Hull, he goes, hey, we got this thing going on in Arizona. Do we have the do we have the software up yet? I haven't really talked about the software. I'm like, I don't know. Let's try it. It, it worked out. Um, but they were they were facing a mountain lion ban there. Crushed that at the commission level. There's a lot of wins. Proactive, defensive. I mean, there's there's hundred of them probably yeah. in the last in the last two years dozens um, dozens so some fun ones too it's you know people forget you know about the win because something else comes up or whatever we just got to continue to to be in the fight um dan you you have a really good analogy on this but back to what you guys were talking about where you know you got trad bow and long you know trappers and whoever and even anglers we have to realize we're all part, we're all, I don't know, branches on the same tree. We need to realize they're trying to chop down the tree. Yeah. You know, and they'll the try trunk. a branch they, at they, a time and, and all that. that. But yeah. one of the, 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 they really laid their cards out with IP3. That's gone now, but it's going to come back as another IP, whatever, 26 or something in, in 2026. And in Oregon, in Oregon, it, if it passed, they're trying to get this on the ballot. If that passed, you would not be able to fish. You would not be able to hunt. You would not be able to sell meat, slaughter beef, breed lease, animals. Lease your dog. Yeah, in, <laughs> in Oregon. So that's the cards are on the table with that one. Like that's what they're trying to get to. Uh, it's pretty wild to think of. Oh, there's no way they can pass that. Well, they're trying to. They tried it and in this, Colorado. This, this lion thing or this bear thing or this turkey thing, whatever it is, it's all leading, you know, to that point. And um, yeah, I mean, their we, their North Star is very well in, yeah. in plain view that it is just no anything like yeah. done with all killing. Yeah. 
which is really it's anti wildlife. Yeah, it's it's, it's right human. It's what are we doing for the the management tool is taken out? Well, that's anti wildlife. That's what's crazy. I I I view them as that they're anti human. They're not just anti hunting, right? Yeah. It, hunting is an intrinsic human value. Really, I'm going out there and getting wild food. You went to the supermarket and got food. Well, I spent two weeks in Idaho and had an adventure. You know, all the things that go with it. And what did, what really did I do? I came home with wild food, and that's what I'm eating every single day of my life. We've said this in one of our commercials that we did last year on the public education campaign that we did. And and uh, there's a statement that, that talks about 9% of elk hunters in the state of Colorado are successful. That means 91% aren't. And the the narrator says, can you imagine going to the grocery store and being unsuccessful 91% of the time? <laughs> and and I mean, there's there's a component there that we continually provide for the system so the system can provide for the resource and the resource can provide back to the to the people that provide for the system. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about the defeatist attitude, you know, we see that dramatically. But what I would say is success breeds momentum and momentum breeds success. Negativity just breeds stupidity and stupidity breeds negativity. And, uh, and I think that if you're not in that wheelhouse, it's easy to turn around and say that it doesn't affect me. If you're not in the, in the, 91% of the unsuccessful elk hunters in the state of Colorado, uh, maybe that doesn't affect you as much. But 91% of them are paying into the to the system mm -hmm. so they can provide for the resource so the general public, the non-hunting general public, can benefit off of what 100% mm -hmm. of those licensed purchasers provide. And I want to mention that even the, the qualifying licensed purchaser within the state of Colorado specifically or providing to the resource so the non-hunter and the anti-hunter can benefit off of what is being provided to the system because we're not tax-based. It, it's generated through license revenue. Everybody benefits off of hunting and fishing. It's just whether they realize it or not. Mm -hmm. The people that sit there on our side and go, well, guess we're going to lose another one here. Guess that one, chalk that one up for the antis. I don't want them being the quarterback on my freaking football team. Mm -hmm. You know, you're no. down two minutes. Two minutes, you got six points yeah. down, and uh, come on. If we're going to really stand and prop up the North American model of wildlife conservation, responsible wildlife management, which is our mission for CRWM, if we're going to prop that up nationwide, if people are going to really buy into that, how do you have a defeatist attitude when somebody's wanting to take away things from you, whether you're the muskrat trapper in Louisiana or whether you want to turn around and hunt red squirrels in the north or you want to hunt a bighorn sheep in Alberta, Canada? We have to figure out a way to plant our flag collectively and say, you want it? Come and get it. But you ain't going to take it easily. And we're going to turn on and give you the best damn fight that we could possibly do. And all, by the way, it's not going to be within the state confines of the boundaries that were set. It's going to be within the region. It's going to be within the nation. It's going to be within North America. And we turn around and say, you come take it, but we're not going to let you take it from us or anybody else. That's good. There's a I'm lot of you there yeah. in Colorado, right? Yeah. Like 5,000 lions. I think if if mountain lion hunting as a mechanism to regulate them is removed, the number of mountain lions will double in five years. Yeah. And that's going to be a net new harvest yeah, even if it of 150,000 mule deer compounding. off the landscape every year. That's a lot of mule deer to be dying every year to then not be available for tags for non-resident hunts for the guide and outfitter community yeah it's and massive I, and i think a good point of that too is the evil the evil on that anti-hunting side they don't give a shit if there is no animals they just don't want the hunters killing them they no just, they, they'd they don't rather have a every, barren landscape yeah that, they don't that care takes us out of the game every which mule is, deer dies which is insanity it's as like, long as the mountain lions they're crazy we, it's the, crazy. the hunters can't protect them just let you let them all go by the wayside through predators. Yeah, right? that's like why that's, that's why I see them as anti-human. They're anti-wildlife. They're anti-human. Mm -hmm. Yeah, open Poison. space, open space without wildlife is just open space. It's not wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. And and so when you have apex predators that are being pedestalized, and the people that provide the funding resource to those management species of the apex predators. And the game species in Colorado, for an example, it's 78 species out of 961 species of wildlife. When you pedestalize something and marginalize or bastardize something else, what's going to suffer? All of it. Mm -hmm. Be because it's it's a circle of life. Yeah, there's a natural resource management component. But their, their goal is to, to take us out of the equation, 
to let the apex predators manage what we pay to be able to do. The more that they eat, the less resource that there is for us to be able to provide an opportunity, which is the mission of Colorado Parks and Wildlife, mission of every game agency that I'm aware of, take less, take more of us off the landscape. There's less money provided to the management system, less money. Now you need less licenses because you don't have them because they're all the apex predators are eating and stuff. Pretty soon you get to a point who's going to end up paying for this. Everything can't be a government taxpayer type deal. People pay in a, a pay to play deal on license purchases in the North American model because they want to. It's not a tax. They don't have to. It's because they want to. Who the hell do you have on this landscape that wants to do anything? I don't see anybody lining up saying, I need to pay more taxes. If they go yeah. to the ballot, they might be able to turn around and do that. But that's always like a, a 51 to 49 or a 52 to 48. A hundred percent of sportsmen and women buy a license because they want to. And every person on the flipping planet benefits off of their license purchases for wildlife management. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's an amazing system, right? It, the, yeah. the want to pay in uh -huh. because of what we want to do. It's an amazing system. Mm -hmm. Nobody forces anybody to pay to go to Disney World. Yeah. It's because they want to. But it's it's interesting that we can all agree that that's what we do and that's what we want to do. But the second it comes down to trad bow or long range or this, <laughs> then it just starts to fray out and become mm -hmm. something different. Well, look, it's really I, wild, I, Lorenzo. I'm a trapper. Nobody's had your back. The trapper's been the ugly stepchild on a milk carton for the last 55 years, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it was the, low, the lowest hanging fruit. Easiest thing to turn around and take off the tree, get the fruit off, chop, cut the branch off, chop the tree down, walk into the forest. Mm -hmm. Look at how many trapping initiatives have come up in the United States where trapping was the forefront and the rest of the sportsman community didn't jump on board. I'm the Colorado Trappers and Predator Hunters Association president, president and have been for the last 12 years. The reason that we formulated CRWM is because I kept going to the other sportsman organizations and we needed their support on issues even after we lost trapping in 96 and went there and I said, I need your logo, I need your support. And they're like, no, I don't know, Gates, I don't know if we can put that on there because that's pretty controversial. But when we formulated CRWM, and said, we need your logo along with the Trapper's logo underneath of the umbrella for CRWM. Oh, yeah, put our name on there. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't do it if it was set by itself because there was a negative connotation assumed with something that they had no knowledge about because even our guys had been befuddled and lied to about what trapping was. I went to a game conference for Colorado Parks and Wildlife about six, seven years ago in front of 350 biologists, science-based biologists. And I said, you know one thing that we all have in common? is I'm a trapper and every single one of you guys are here too. Mm -hmm. And they looked at each other and said, well, I don't, I said, you, you trapped bullfrogs in that study, didn't you? Did you do crayfish? Didn't you do bighorn sheep? Aren't you collaring it? And aren't you studying? And you're trapping all that stuff? It started to open up the eyes of people that have been science-based wildlife managers for all of their lives, their entire career, but they never considered themselves to be a trapper. Mm -hmm. Now we're all sportsmen whether they hunt fish or trap or whatever, they understand that because you had to put it into their wheelhouse to where they could fully understand that it, this makes this work and without that, you can't have this. I'm at the point now to where, look, I've got probably you know, 10, 12, 15 years left on this planet, maybe 20. I hope I'm not in We're going to juicy up. You're, yeah. you're, yeah. yeah. you're going to make it to 100. Well, sure. yeah. so I'm sure everybody will be happy with that. Too. Yeah. But who are we going to instill five or 10 or 15 years down the road on the next issue in another state that somebody doesn't really pay attention to or that they're marginalized. We create a network. We create that big net that we can turn around and cast out. And no matter what, this string connects to that string and that knot as part of this. And then you look at the framework. We can make this work. We've got the North American model of wildlife conservation that we can make work. You tell me what the antis have. They don't have a model. Their model is to turn around and degrade and erode and bastardize every single thing that we do. We have something to prop up that we can that we can pedestalize, and we should be able to do that because as I said this in one of the other podcasts. They are terrorizing our efforts to sustain wildlife conservation in perpetuity, and that doesn't mean for the next five years. That means from where they started things 125 years ago to where we are today to where we still have what we want 125 years when we're all dead and gone. We have to figure out a way to prop that up. This is our stuff. This is our effort. It's not theirs. Are we going to let them take it away? How many animal rights 
conferences or conventions have you seen? <laughs> Look at these things that we're doing here today. We all come together for this because we're trying to promote the industry and we're trying to, we're talking about this. We're not marginalizing it. We're not bastardizing it. Don't let them take away what we support that we've got instilled that is in federal legislation and state legislation. It's our duty to do so. And if we can't figure out a way to do that amongst ourselves, nobody else is going to do it for us. Yeah. I think we're figuring it out. I think I, I really, I'm maybe I'm just new enough to all this to be overly optimistic, but I think there's a wave there, like there is an awakening happening. What you, you talked about, like something new's happening here. I think something new is happening here Yeah. Um, on our side, on the hunting side. And I think it's good. Like we're, we're responding. Maybe we're late, but whatever, better, better now than, than never. Yeah, people are getting so, fired up now. Yeah. People, oh, are, yeah. Getting, people are waking yeah. up and, yeah. and, and, and the validation pyramid or chain is happening where people are starting to jump in where maybe they weren't jumping in six months ago and, and more people will, you know, next month and the month after that. And so it's, I, um, it's, I, it's I, happening. I absolutely believe that we can, we can win this in Colorado and it will be, it will be a setback to the anti-hunting industry <laughs> because it'll be, you know, it, it'll cost them money. They'll have spent money. They'll have spent credibility. And if they lose, um, you know, that's a setback for them in Colorado and everywhere else. It, while it, it vaults us forward so we can do more proactive work mm -hmm. that's not just, you know, defending things. Because there's a lot of proactive work to do. There's 82 million sportsmen. That, so that's anglers and hunters and sports shooters. Somewhere around that number. Whatever it is, it's a large number. That's a juggernaut. If we organize 1% of that... We're bigger than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that is what we are working on. That is the next stage that we are actively um, engaging in to, uh, to, to bring that organization. Charles, there was, a, there was a deal said that, that, that sportsmen and women in the United States would be the largest army in the world. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And not to mechanize this from a militia standpoint, but if we're, if we're considered by outsiders as the largest army, the potential largest army in the world, why can't we, we be the largest army in conservation mm -hmm. in the world? Yeah. We are. It's just that we don't do a very good job of our planting our flag and telling everybody about it. But if other countries or other individuals recognize our efforts as gun-toting, archery-toting individuals that could turn around and become the largest army in the world, well, I think that we're the ar largest army in the United States. We could turn around and do and, and the thing is, what we do is for everybody. It's not, yeah. for, it's not for us. We're not selfish about this. We're doing it so everybody can benefit off of it. Yeah, you keep saying resource, and I think when people hear it, they re, we, we have a tendency to refer back to the resources that we value. We hunt, we fish, you know, elk, deer, bighorn, sheep. But reality is, is that goes across the entire board for every every yeah. species, every resource, every mm -hmm. every animal. Mm -hmm. You know, passerines and waterfowl and, you know, insects and bugs and boreal toads and whatever it is. You know, it's, it's, it's everything. And I think, I think two trail is, I become fairly good friends with Shane Mahoney with conservation yeah. visions and, and, and Shane and I have d different perspectives because of where I live and where he comes from and what his message is. But the, the wild harvest initiative is something that, that can be instilled to the general public, whether they hunt or fish mm -hmm. and the ideology behind that, because they might go out and collect medicinal plants. They might like to get pinion nuts. They might get deer antlers or firewood. It all comes from the landscape. And while Conservation Visions is doing a, a, a uh, roadmap about natural resource consumption and utilization of that food source na or worldwide, stop and think, we couldn't feed the planet off of domestic livestock production. We feed the planet off of what the planet gives us. Mm -hmm. Now, has some of that been overused and abused? Yeah. But there's not any single thing that's ever become extinct or extirpated off this planet under a highly regulated wildlife management system. <laughs> when you don't have that, when you can't turn around and prop that up, that's when you have the marginalization of wildlife management. What we have to deal with on our level is make sure that the, that non-hunter, that anti-hunter realizes that they, they get something off the planet too. They get something off the resource too. Yeah. If they want to go pick flowers for crying out loud, sure. they're taking something. Mm -hmm. If the, if they want to, yeah, see some of these other animals, exactly. I mean, it's, it's it's all it's cascading, right? And it's it's been a model that's worked. It's been mm -hmm. the most successful wildlife management model ever. We let's not let's not let let's it be marginalized. It. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's let's prop it. 
keep going. The the real magic in that too about being, you know, the most successful wildlife management plan on on planet Earth. That's with public land in it as well, mm-hmm. which is a wild thing to think about, right? Like conservation when you look at it from a private standpoint, like Texas is uh, Texas is it's one of a kind, right? And I think Texas gets a lot of stigma too, just from, you know, Texans being Texans and, <laughs> you know, everything's bigger in Texas and Dallas Cowboys and all you can go down the list, right? <laughs> it's an incredible place though with that MDL program they have, the managed deer license, where mm-hmm. these private landowners, they, they all come together and, and truly manage for, yep. you know, age structure and, and better better wildlife, healthier wildlife. They, they manage sickness and they manage herd health and they manage herd age criteria all this stuff right but when you <clears throat> when you look at it it's all private so it's like it makes sense what's really what's really is astonishing honestly in my opinion is when you look at the west how successful this wildlife management program is that is with primarily public, public land, land involved mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's an that's an incredible thing that everybody can go to that everyone has use case worldwide on this, Worldwide, anyone Doesn't matter from where you're from, you can land in San Francisco and drive Earth. up into the Tahoe National Forest, and boom, you can be that on public land is public yours. land, and it's it's accessible to anyone. Yeah, and we're making wildlife management work with with that type of human access and as ma- as many animals as and, we have and, on the landscape. And, and if you look at case yeah. in point, when you talk about the public land and the public trust doctrine, which is in the North American model. And you get the antis that stand up at some commission meeting or some legislative hearing and go, this is public resource. This is public wildlife. And I'm like, well, I'm part of the, part of the public, too. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it, what you want yeah. to classify yourselves as it, it's public for your use. It's not. It's all of our use. But yeah. it's also the stewardship and management that goes into that use to where they can benefit off of it. And, and if you look at states like Colorado, where 47 percent of all the land is, is public and the rest of it is private. The private-public partnership and conservation efforts is insurmountable. It's not a, it, you don't have that anywhere, as far as countries are concerned. Yeah. You have it in the West. You have it to some degree in the East. But public-private partnerships. We got habitat partnership programs. We got habitat conservation easement programs. We got things to make sure that we have wildlife in perpetuity. And the stewardship stewardship of our natural resources is is undeniable. Yeah. That all happens to, for everybody's benefit. But when they get up to testify at a, at a committee hearing or something, they come from their perspective. They don't come from our perspective. When I get up and talk, I talk about the resource for the benefit of the public, which is, which is contradictory because I'm arguing for the people that are trying to take it away for them. from us. Yeah. And I'm saying, you are part of this. That's why we supply it. Now, you got your God-given right to be able to gripe and moan and groan and bitch and complain about it. <laughs> but we have something in common, and that's what I try to bring to the conversation for commonality. We we all we love wildlife. The antis, the non-hunter, the sportsman and woman, the hunter. We all love wildlife. It's just we have a different perspective on how we're going to accomplish what our goals are. But when it gets to the anti side of it, it's making sure that we aren't part of that equation. We're not part of the landscape. Mm-hmm. But they want everything that they want, and they want everything that we have. And we have a system that works. What's your website? Yeah, we, the hunt we, where, where, we, where are we going to let's, drop yeah. fifty bucks? Yeah, let's let's do that. We'll yeah, get right. to the end. I, I wanted to say that I really appreciate just the the time that you gave us, and it's been this is a lot of podcasting for me is like who do we want to talk to? Like what personally? Who do, who am I interested in talking to? And part part of it also is like who are people that we think we can you know elevate a message and get it out there. This has been hit hit on both accounts for me. It's been really interesting to just, just to hear you talking. One of my favorite things that I've felt today isn't necessarily like the words, but the passion comes through. Like I, I feel exactly. your, I feel your passion for it, and I feel how genuinely you believe it. And that's more important to me than just about anything. Like when you've got an individual that's going to lead an organization, they're leading a message. I want to know that they, without doubt, believe and live and and die with what you're saying and i believe it what you're saying so i really Thank appreciate you. you getting getting a chance to sit and talk with you um i yeah i just i wanted to wrap up with that and just say i really appreciate the time and and yeah give us your websites give us you know give us all the details and also yeah go ahead so save the hunt colorado.com uh i did want to say that you know the issues committee that we formulated uh 
that that is required in Colorado as far as when you get into campaign type stuff. It's still a five hundred one c four, and and that's Colorado Wildlife deserve better. So they got two options they can contribute to. Save the hunt Colorado dot com is probably more prominent for the sportsman and woman because they can they, they can you know save the hunt. It's it's easily recognizable. The Colorado Wildlife deserve better is for sportsmen and women, but it's also for the target audience. So we're going to have to end that message into. First and foremost, I, I appreciate you acknowledging and recognizing the passion because mm-hmm. because we eat, live, sleep, drink, drive, screw every, <laughs> everything about wildlife and conservation efforts. Mm-hmm. I mean, my wife and my son and myself have sacrificed an enormous amount of time, effort, financial resources, uh, you know, family structure because I'm tired of watching people point fingers at other people because somebody else wasn't doing something. If it's one guy that can turn around and motivate, great. But if one guy can turn into 10 guys or 20 guys or 50 guys, and I mentioned this to you in the, in the lobby over there, without the ability to message to the masses, mm-hmm. this would just be the same thing that we're doing in Colorado just to, to be able to try to keep our head above water on conservation efforts. Mm-hmm. The community itself has outreached so phenomenally over the course of the last two and a half months that I think that's part of the roadmap. I think that's part of the blueprint. I don't want people to, to all these messages to fall on deaf ears because if you start talking about alligator trapping in Florida or you start talking about Thule elk hunting up in the Northwest or whatever the issue is, I want people to pay particular attention. Have your regular podcast, have your regular celebrity shows, do all your outreach, you know, do the fun and games and the out and what we actually strive to do from a recreational standpoint, avocation. But the fight has got to be 50% of all of that effort. And I'm not, not, not saying 50% of all podcasts and 50% of all mm-hmm. books and television shows. Nobody wants to turn around and watch us for the rest of our lives talk about the doom and gloom of what's happening. But I think five years from now, we'll be talking about the successes mm-hmm. of what we capitalized on based upon what happened in Colorado. Yeah. It's an investment. Yeah. yeah. That's just how you have to look at it. It's a yeah. reference point. <laughs> yeah. you, you, did tell, you did tell me something in the, in the lobby that I want to bring up is, you know, this is, uh, this is more important to a non-resident than it is Colorado. Yeah. Because if this happens in Colorado, it's coming to your state too. Yeah. Like you're, this you're, is, this is the front, this is the front lines of yeah. it. You're losing Colorado. You're, yeah. Things will degrade and in it's Colorado coming to, and, it's and coming it to will you, show up on it's your, coming it, to you and it'll show up so on your doorstep. If we all can't band together and beat this in Colorado, yeah. it's, it's coming to us. And you told me the story of a, a gator, a gator, a gator, hunter, yeah. gator trapper. In, yeah. Where was he? Yeah. Florida. Florida. Yeah. He wrote a hand, a cursive handwritten letter with a $250 check. Yeah. And, and he said, I'm never going to get to Colorado. Uh, I want to support everything that you're doing, but I hope that there's somebody like you to help me support yeah. c- Florida when they come to take gator trapping away. Yeah, that's an that's an impactful that's an impactful <laughs> statement right there. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that that is genuinely what's happening. That and, and that's what when when somebody sends us something for twenty dollars, or they send us five thousand dollars. We we came from a shot show, went home. My wife went to the post office box. We get a ten thousand dollar check from somebody that we had no idea from from New Jersey. Mm-hmm owns a refrigeration company. We reach out to them and, and they said, that's not the only one. Yeah. Uh, when, when you turn around and open th- the post office box and then she sees something on the website and it's a $20 check or a $20 donation. And the next month it's a $20 check or $20 donation from the same person. They see the value. Mm-hmm. They see the effort that you're putting out on their account and they don't want to see you fall. And I really, really honestly believe guys, the people want to be part of a winning team. They want Absolutely. to be part of a success. They want to be part of kicking somebody back. Maybe they lost a little bit where they're at. Maybe they watched somebody else lose something. They want to be part of a winning team and create the momentum and success. Absolutely. I, I really believe that. Absolutely. So we, w- we want to get involved um, as, as deep as we possibly can with, with CRWM right now because we believe that is you know the, the most pressing thing going on. So for us, if anybody signs up for Insider, which is our, our paid for product and uses the promo code CRWM, we're going to donate a hundred dollars to oh. you for everyone that signs up. And then also I, I am extremely wow. passionate personally about conservation and I have been my entire life. I'm going to match personally everything that go hunt drives. Holy moly. So for everybody who signs up using CRWM for Insider, 
we'll donate a hundred bucks to to you in the fight going on in Colorado, and then I'll match that personally as well. That's so badass. I've been very fortunate and blessed in my life to hunt where I've hunted, to hunt the things that I've hunted. So yeah, I'm uh, just throwing down the gauntlet. Doing. Yeah, that's awesome. That that's is great. phenomenal. That's and I hope I think it. you're going to inspire some people I hope, with that I hope too. too. I think I, hope that's I think you're going to inspire some people with that too. That's phenomenal. It's a message. <laughs> it's a message that people can capitalize off of and see just how successful that we continue to move and move the needle. Yeah. And uh, like, I, you know, my, my gratitude, I can't, I can't even express it. I mean, you know, what you're offering, but what you've offered just for even this format mm -hmm. to take the time out of the, the Western Hunt Expo to come over here to have this conversation. And, and uh, I feel like it's building a team and it's building a relationship, not just with here, but you're actually looking at position players and who's really good at different things. And I think that we have those resources available to us industry-wise, organization-wise, individual-wise, entity-wise, agency-wise. Maybe all of this connects and other people want to get on board for a variety of different reasons. Yeah. And maybe it instills enthusiasm from game agencies and from the managers to look at the options that are available to them outside of their normal channels and resources and capitalize on that as well. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I mean, we, we feel indebted to, to you, honestly, you're the one that's, you're the one that's taking up the fight. I, I mean, I feel like we're the, I, I, you know, I feel like we're the beneficiaries of somebody who's willing to Thank put you. on the line. The least we can do is support in the ways that, that we know we can and where we can be impactful, you know? So that's, Thank that's you for making that easy. Doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. That's and awesome. then, uh, and going forward, like you said, it's a constant fight. We're going to, we want to team up with Hal as well, and we'll figure out, we'll figure out ways to do that. We'll focus on the task at hand for now yeah. and what's going on in Colorado. And then, yeah, right then we'll go for there. Cool. Yeah. Well, well you, you guys help us out in numerous ways anyway. Uh, besides just sharing information, we have, we, uh, we sell both subscriptions that go hunt and you get a Hal membership mm -hmm. with that. Maybe we can figure out some way to, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, and then you guys are also i think matching funds for the pn wild shirt the bear hunting is conservation yep. so you guys are an awesome help anyway we try, and, we try and to thank do you for we everything we, we've always been really bad in the past of talking about what we do because we yeah. feel like it's a it, it's something it's something we believe in and, and we would do anyways so why why promote and put it out there because it kind of you know what i mean kind of yeah. sounds like it's the people that donate on camera and then put it out for the world to see like yeah. what really what was the purpose yeah, yeah, yeah. um but yeah we yeah we we want to stay focused on it do as much as we can that's what it's going to take that's why i think we're going to win and that's why yeah. i think overall uh what we're really trying to get to here is 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 going to be successful because yeah. uh i mean just the last few months the level of engagement just oh, yeah. it's historical actually it really is yeah. it's historical yeah mm -hmm. so it gets me excited i get emotional about yeah it. <laughs> it's huge i do too i, I really do. yeah thank you thanks Dan. yeah love it guys yep thank you look forward to it yeah.